Welcome to Fantasy Sports Daily with Ray Flowers, Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget to use the promo code FSD20 for a 20% discount on the products over at FantasyGuru.com. Welcome to Fantasy Sports Daily. I'm your host, Ray Flowers. I'm cleaning my eyeballs out because it's early in the morning here. Didn't party too hard last night. I did go to a tiki bar yesterday for uh, Easter. We didn't celebrate Easter, but I went to a tiki bar. Uh, I see a question here, and I'm just going to address it right off the top because it's a very important question from Anthony. Uh, Anthony, is it your birthday or is a sub tricking us? Yes, Anthony, it is my birthday. Uh, I'm April Fool's kid. Always been an April Fool's kid, obviously. That was the day I was born. Uh, my brother and I are two years and two days apart, so we almost had the same birthday. I was born early. He was born late. We almost met up in the middle there with the same birthday. But yes, it is indeed my birthday today. I am all of 32 years old, or at least I was at one point. I am Ray Flowers of FantasyGuru.com. Thanks for joining me today here on the show. Uh, lots to talk about here in the world of baseball, obviously. Uh, we're going to have you know a discussion here as we do every day on Fantasy Sports Daily, Daily Monday through Friday at 11 o'clock Eastern time. Just talking about what's going on in the world of sports. And I thought it was really good or useful, I guess is a better way to put it, really useful at this point of the year to kind of go over some overarching themes uh, as well as hitting on some of the questions you directly have. So we'll do that. We'll talk about some of the hot players, some of the cold players. Um, what does it mean? What do you take away from this stuff? We'll do that here on Fantasy Sports Daily. Again, I'm Ray Flowers. You can find me at fantasyguru.com. You can find me here on the show again Monday through Friday, Fantasy Sports Daily. This show's free. Uh, we've got a couple shows on SiriusXM. We need to have a subscription for that. Uh, Elite Sports Game Time, which I'm on with Justin Fensterman, Monday through Thursday from 8 to 10 Eastern. During those shows, we talk shop. We talk what's going on on the field in the evening. So we'll cover basketball. We'll cover hockey. Big focus on baseball now that the season started. We'll talk about the bets we have for the day. Uh, those ones the ones we post over at FantasyGuru.com. We'll talk about them on the show this evening. So that's Monday through Thursday, 8 to 10. Elite Sports Game Time. And then Jeff Manns, of course, is Monday through Friday from 3 to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Elite Sports. Uh, he hosts that show, and I'm with him every Wednesday. Uh, just a, another update for everyone here. Some housekeeping stuff before we dive into the news and notes. Uh, don't forget that uh, you can get subscriptions to a bunch of products that we have at FantasyGuru.com, but you can always try that promo code that you see on the screen there, FSD20. Whether you're talking seasonal, DFS, wagering, you can give all of those a, a, a thought. You can type in FSD20 and see if it works. I don't even know if it works in all of them, to be fair. I think it does. But just give it a shot. Uh, we have the all-in package, too, if you want to get all the baseball coverage we have that includes DFS, wagering, and seasonal. It can all be covered there over at FantasyGuru.com. You can find me on social medias in the different spots at the Ray Flowers. Um, so there you go. We'll come back to some more uh, news and notes of things you can get with us over at FantasyGuru.com. Oh, wait, before I do that, actually, one last note. Uh, the Smash Report is now up, and it's operational at FantasyGuru.com. There's an article that went up over the weekend describing what the Smash Report is. The Smash Report is elite data, so it is an additional edition. Additional edition, good word, wording, right? It's an addition to your normal subscription. If you want to have access to that, you get access to the Burr Report, which is the bullpen uses and reliever rating system. He used to do a bunch of data plans if you add that to your product. Again, there's an article over at the site talking about the Smash uh, tool, uh, the advantage score. What are they Are they good for? What, what does it do? Well, it tracks what's going on in each individual day. It looks at the offensive side of things. It looks at the hitting side of things. Uh, we spent a long time, myself and Jeff Manns, creating this tool, um, months actually. And so what it does is it, does, it says, okay, who is the hitter? Who is the pitcher? How do they match? Because again, it's great to know who the hitter is. It's great to know who the pitcher is. But how does it match? Do do does what the hitter does well and the pitcher does well? Does it match? Does it not match? Does the hitter have the advantage? Does the pitcher have the advantage? That's what the tool attempts to do. So you can get that. It's part of again the elite data plan. It's an additional to your regular. Uh, it's great for DFS, of course, because it helps you target guys that are undervalued to, to utilize that day. It's also great for seasonal. If you have a question about which guy to put in your UT spot or do you start this pitcher or not, obviously it's got that too. The data there is working. The numbers you see on the screen, we're still working with the tech people. I've had this long discussion. And I apologize for this. The tech fella is getting the data to show accurately on the screen. It is working. The tool is working. It's just still drawing the data in terms of the feed from the games from last year. So don't worry if you see a number there that doesn't make sense. 25 games played. Yeah, I know that. And I'm sorry for that. 
I've been on the tech team for a while now to get this fixed. Let's hope that they get it fixed today. But the tool itself is working. Okay. What are we talking about today here on the show? Uh, here we go. Let's get that little thing out of the way. We're going to talk some major storylines hot and cold. And I thought this would be a good way to get into it. There will be a more complete article this week. I'm going to dive in and say this is what you need to know about a lot of things in terms of sample size. Uh, but we'll talk today about some hot and cold players in particular, some situations that you all have questions about. Uh, again, promo code FSD20 to sign up for the products at fantasyguru.com. The show is always stored over at fantasyguru.com, the Elite Plus tab at the top. You can always go to youtube.com slash at Elite Plus Network to find it on the YouTube page. You can also watch us live there if you want to do that. And then, of course, you can just type in fantasy sports today. Um, there's fantasy sports daily. Excuse me, I forgot the name of the show. Fantasy Sports Daily, just type it into, you know, Pandora, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, and uh, hopefully it'll come up as being available where you listen to your podcast. So there's many ways to listen into the show. Okay, so let's start with an overarching theme before I get into any specifics. And again, there'll be an article that'll have all the data and they'll break this down in much more depth than I'm going to share here with you all today. It, it feels like we've been playing for a long time since the game started in Seoul, right? You haven't even played in a week. Okay. And as the article will say, and I will preview here, because I know what I'm going to write, the only reason, and I said this myself, I in my leagues, my leagues are different because most of my leagues are 14 and 15 team leagues. So all the players, anyone, all you are talking about were drafted in, on the majority of my leagues. We have the fab article that comes out from Patio Joe on the weekend. Um, what do we do with these hot starting players? And the main point is the following. We don't have anywhere near enough data at this point in time to make any determination on players thumbs up or thumbs down. We just don't. It's not even close. So don't play that game. You know, someone's three for 16 and they suck. Let's get rid of them. No. Someone's eight for 17. Let's add them because they're great. No. Okay. The, the game of baseball is not played that way. The only reason that you should be making changes right now is if, A, you have an injury which absolutely you make a change. B, if somehow in your league, you know, someone, you know, Luis Arias wasn't drafted or someone let him go, okay, well, then you, you add yeah, him, okay. That doesn't happen. Or there is a playing time change. And that, I mean, that's really it. There's a lot of questions that come in because, you know, Bailey Ober looked terrible, right? Jerry Jones looked great. We'll talk about Jones in a bit. Um, do we drop over for Jones? I'm not saying anyone directly asked me that question, but that's the mindset people have. Don't do it. The rankings that were good for you to do a draft 10 days ago are still good, unless there was a playing time change or an injury. The rankings aren't for the first five days of the season. You shouldn't look at them that way. You know, I haven't had too many people do this, but I've had a couple people come to me and say, well, what are you, do you like player A or player B? Look at the rankings. I didn't spend five months doing the rankings to change them after five games. Remember? So have some patience with these guys. If you're not going to have patience with these guys, it's going to be a long season for you. My decisions on players are not NOT, always going to be correct. 100% not going to be correct. Okay, that's not happening. If that's your expectation or that's what you're hearing me say, you're, you're not, your expectations are wrong. You're not hearing what I'm saying. What I'm talking to you about is the mindset and the plan that we need to have in place. You can't jump, 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 jump. It's like the grass is always green on the other side thing. You know, you're dating a beautiful woman that stood by your side for three years, but here's a Brazilian supermodel. Well, I'm going to the Brazilian supermodel. Okay, that'll be fun for two weeks until you find out the Brazilian supermodel's crazy. And the love of your life now doesn't trust you because you dumped her for the Brazilians. So be cautious. It's not always better over there. Not that I have any experience with that, of course. I just heard an interesting story over the weekend with a Brazilian, a hot Brazilian au pair. Pretty interesting story. Uh, but so realize that there needs to be a breath, okay? Unless there's an injury or a playing time change. We just don't have enough data otherwise. Let's start out with some of the news and notes here that we can get to. Um, and let's start out with one of the, the big ones is that we talked all spring about Kevin Gaussman and what's Kevin Gaussman going to look like and when's Kevin Gaussman going to return and is he going to miss a turn or two through the rotation? That was the expectation all along for the the Blue Jays and all of a sudden, boom, he's out there throwing four and a third innings on the weekend. So not nothing close to the delay we anticipated. 
I haven't seen any updates after the game that there were any hiccups. So it looks like he came through this clue clearly. Um, he walked nobody. He struck out six guys only through four and a third innings, but still pitched very well, looked good, and we're back in business with Kevin Gaussman. Now, there was never a belief that this was going to be a significant injury. That doesn't mean that this great start should remove the fact that he was dealing with something in spring. No, that's still there, right? But that first outing looked really solid, and it's very promising. And again, as we've discussed here, Kevin Gaussman is someone that has been through the wars and all of that, and you have to feel confident that he's going to find a way to navigate things. Uh, looks like, again, you might get a couple extra starts out of Kevin Gaussman, which doesn't sound like a lot until you re realize that, okay, maybe that's 10 innings, maybe it's 14 strikeouts with the two ERA. Then it matters. So we'll see what the next outing, but he looked really good. Uh, on the on the hitting side of things, let's talk about a couple guys. I want to pull up some data here. Teoscar Hernandez is off to a good start. And there's a player profile on him over at fantasyguru.com. Go to the top, you know, baseball, seasonal player profiles drops up in the da drop down menu. And you'll find an article, a write up there uh, that I had with, sorry, uh, that I had with Teoscar Hernandez. He's off to a good start. Three home runs, six RBI, seven runs scored. The Dodgers offense is already looking epic. Uh, and that's what Shohei Otani not even doing much. To Oscar Hernandez, you know, powering the baseball is not a surprise. That's what he does. He's very good at that. Now, I will say that on the surface, again, three home runs, seven runs scored, six RBIs in six games. This looks spectacular. Did you notice he struck out 12 times and 24 at-bats? And you thought Joey Gallo was bad. Like that. Woo so he's had some big flies and he's put some hurt on the baseball. But um, there, there's as much going. And I know it's, he's listed hot on the preview. There's as much going negative as there is a positive with him. So let's pump the brakes on, you know, Teoscar Hernandez is going to hit 45 home runs this year and be an all-star. Hey, man, he might go nuts. But that contact rate in the early going is scary bad. For a guy that's right around 30% most of the time, it's way worse than that. It's 46% the strikeout rate. Keep an eye on that. Small sample size. Keep an eye on that. A small sample size that is also produced in the early going is Luis Camposano. Now, Camposano, who plays for the Padres, he's their catcher. May not have been drafted. You're in a 10-team, 12-team league. You have one catcher. Maybe he wasn't drafted, okay? All of my leagues, again, he was drafted in the mid-rounds because there are two catcher leagues, 14, 15, team. But maybe not in your in your scenario. And while we're still talking a small sample size, his last 186 at-bats, which is last year and the early start this year, set in 328. Okay, now the and, and he makes excellent contact. His strikeout rate is 11% in those roughly 200 plate appearances. Now he's got a 4% walk rate. So there's some hacking going on here. Uh, he's got an elevated batting average of balls in play of almost 340. You know, he's not a speed burner. He's not beating out balls on the ground. So there obviously is going to be pullback with, there with him. But the point being that Camposano is one of the few catchers that you could see hitting 275 with 15 home runs. There's just not that many of the guys out there like that. Uh, I'm not going to be against someone making a move to add Camposano. If you did that over the weekend, I think it's okay. Depends who you've jettisoned like that, you know, again, because I, I don't think in most scenarios, if you start one catcher, picking up a second catcher is the best thing to do. I'm in one league like that. The Sirius XM host league that they had us do is a very condensed rosters. Uh, and in that league, we only start one catcher. So it's like Camposano was on the waiver wire. I didn't pick him up because I had, who did I have? I should have told the story a little bit better. Uh, in that league, I had Kiebert Ruiz, and I just want to set with Kiebert Ruiz. But we have a very small lineup, so that was an option to pick up. So there are some scenarios where, again, Camposano is a strong catcher, too, with the ability to be a catcher one if it all comes together. So not that bad of an option. Let's talk about – I'll talk about two situations, even though they're out of order. And I say it like that because we've got two situations in two bullpens in particular that people have really – hit on here in the early going. I updated the closer grid a couple days ago over at fantasyguru.com. I listed everything. Remember, we used the, the green, white, and red. And there were a couple scenarios that were like, eh, okay. One of those scenarios is the situation with the uh, Tigers. Alex Lang had a rough first outing. Not only did Alex Hang Lang have a rough first outing, Jason Foley comes out, he's throwing 100 miles an hour, and he's getting work in the ninth inning. Am I dropping Alex Lang at this point? No. It's one out. I'm not dropping Alex Lang. Am I going to drop Alex Lang to add 412-year-old Andrew Chafin or Shelby Miller? At this point, I'm not. As I asked, said to people over the weekend when this was coming up, I really thought, and I said this a lot in the preseason, I think I even said it last week here on the show, 
If you drafted Alex Lang, it would have been fantastic to also draft Jason Foley. Jason Foley wasn't even being drafted. His ADP was 450 or 500, whatever the hell it was. Like he wasn't even being drafted. So it would have been great to take him with your last pick to, in essence, handcuff the closer for the Tigers. Is Foley going to take this job in the ninth inning? He might. Is Lang going to lose this job? He might. Will Lang end up falling behind? You know, a, a Chafin as a lefty who's going to be utilized, you know, for certain situations, or Shelby Miller, who has good stuff. He might. I'm not dropping Alex Lang after one outing. I'm not doing it. Okay. Um, for the all the obvious reasons and the fact that you know Lang had 20 plus saves last year. Like, let's not just throw that in the toilet. If we're 10 days from now, we could be having this discussion differently. It could absolutely be going, it could be like Jason Foley's the man. The, the team could come out and say Jason Foley's the man. The team can say Alex Lang's dealing with the hangnail and he's just he hasn't looked good all camp. And okay. So if you want to be proactive and make a move here, I I can't tell you not to do it because it's wrong. And again, this is my huge problem. And it's been my problem for years. And it's why I've talked about this for years. It's my huge problem with why saves leagues suck. Everyone going to the wave where they added Jason Foley this weekend only did it because Lang looked bad in one outing because Foley got a save. That's the only reason. There was no strategy involved here. Again, Foley's ADP, if I'd not, what was it? Five, I think it was in the 500s. No one was drafting Foley. Then three outings into the season for these two guys, let's run to the wave wire and Adam. That's, in my opinion, stupid. It's what you need to do if you're in a saves league, but it's stupid that we have leagues set up this way. Again, we're the first week of the season. We're already dealing with this. And remember, we had Devin Williams go down, Johan Duran go down. We're dealing with injuries. You know, Kaylee Jansen's got a back issue right now. We got all these bullpens that are already in flux. We're five days into the season. So that's kind of my read there. Another scenario is the White Sox. Uh, there's another scenario. Uh, the Brewers we'll get to in a second. Uh, the White Sox. It's like people are trying to figure this out. And uh, you know, again, in the player, in the excuse me, the closer grid that I did last week, this team's in red. There's no idea. None of us have any idea what's going on. We talked about Michael Kopech being moved to the bullpen and how the team could envision him as a closer. We also discussed how last year Michael Kopech was historically horrid, could not throw strikes. His walk rate was atrocious. Will he, at this point of his career, find his home as a closer? He could. He's got good stuff. Could happen. John Brebbia was the guy that we were on three months ago. Then they made the trade with the Padres, did the White Sox. Then I was like, well, what about Stephen Wilson? Jordan Ledger pitched pitch well. There are four guys here, and it's like, eh. You know, so this is another one of those scenarios. We don't know. We didn't know two weeks ago who it was going to be. We didn't know a week ago who it was going to be. We don't know now who it's going to be. We do know that the White Sox aren't going to win many games. I think it's fair to suggest that one of these guys rips off 30 saves would be a huge surprise. This could be a scenario where eight saves here, 14 for this guy, seven for this guy. Like, So, you know, have at it. But remember, the team's context is really bad. The White Sox suck, okay? The team context is bad. There's no clarity with how the bullpen's going to play out. All the guys I mentioned, all right-handers, you know, they have Tim Hill and Tanner Banks in the bullpen as lefties. They have hardly any left-handed pitchers on, on the bullpen, which is a problem for matchups, too. That one's up in the air. Now, on the other side of things, those two were like the uneven, and I kind of went out of order, but I wanted to group all the bullpens together. The one that seems to be having a little more clarity than we anticipated and seems to be the team has decided to go with the guy who we and most, I think, people were prognosticating as the third arm in the bullpen. That's the Brewers. Abner Uribe. Abner Uribe's got a huge arm. Huge arm. Um, he has come out here firing bullets for the Brewers. Uh, he's had two outings. He's had two saves. He's allowed a run, but he was used twice in the ninth inning. Joel Pamps was the guy that I said, he's the guy, even though I don't know what that means. He's got a hold and a save, uh, but he was only used for the save when Abner Uribe wasn't available. So it's looking an awful lot like Abner Uribe is the guy right now with payumps as the backup. Now, again, that's what it's looking like now, number one. Number two, Uribe does have a great arm, but he's not even 24 years old. There are certainly times where he completely loses the strike zone. Uh, last year, his walk rate was, what, 16%, which is horrible, horrible. Uh, that was almost double the league average. Really tough to be consistently effective when you walk that many guys, even if you have a big arm. Early returns are that Uribe is the guy that could change in five days. Uribe could go out and walk six guys in three outings. Like that could absolutely happen. This is another one where we're kind of just, you know, where are we at right now? And the question is not answerable. 
Again, if I had to say it today, it would be Uribe, Payamps, McGill. That's how I would go right now. Of course, Brian Hudson's got a hold and Elvis Pogaro has got a win. So, you know, you know how these things go. But Uribe absolutely could run with this job until Devin Williams is ready to go and ready to return. No clarity, though, on, on what that situation is going to play out as long term. Uh, what about this guy, Jordan Hicks of the Giants? Jordan Hicks uh, comes out and has a strong outing. There were a lot of leagues where he wasn't drafted. Uh, he throws 100 miles an hour, and the Giants are feeling pretty good about themselves right now because he had a good first outing. Logan Webb had a good first outing. Cal Harrison pitched pretty well. Like, this is starting out well for the Giants. The problem the Giants have is that at some point, hypothetically, because you never know if this actually happened, they've got Alex Cobb and Robbie Ray coming back from injury. They've got Blake Snell, who's about ready to, to you know, he's ready to rock and roll for the Giants. So that's Cobb, Ray, Snell, Webb, Harrison. Where is Jordan Hicks? Unless the Giants go with the six-man rotation, he wouldn't be in that rotation. Now, Harrison is a fellow who's young and didn't build up a lot of innings last year. Alex Cobb is always hurt. Uh, Robbie Ray's coming back from Tommy John surgery. Blake Snell's only thrown 130 innings, I think, twice in his career. So I'm not saying that Hicks can't throw 118 innings this year. I'm not suggesting he can't make 20 starts. I'm merely saying with Hicks, understand what you're adding. So if you're going to the wave where you're hoping to get a guy that you know gives you five innings every five games, that pitches effectively with the understanding that he's not throwing 170 innings. If he does, his arm could fly off. I don't think he could throw 170 innings. Uh, the Giants' situation is horribly messed up. All the pitchers can't get healthy. So just be cautious with Hicks. You could also say, look, I'm going to ride Hicks for the next 10 starts, and then when the Giants' rotation gets healthy and he's out of the mix, who cares? Okay, you could absolutely do that. He's got a live arm, but there aren't innings there, and there are questions about the workload. What about the Dodgers? Mookie Betts the best player going? Is he the best player in the history of – no. We saw that last year with Ronald Acuna. Maybe? I don't know. Mookie Betts is – you know, we had all this discussion, and I say it all the time, the talk about who to take in the first round. They're all kind of the same guy. It's kind of dealer's choice. Betts was a guy that, you know, we were extremely on because of the outfield, second base, shortstop eligibility, because he's an absolute monster across the board, because he always plays and he's always productive. And through six games this year, I mean, he's, what, 11 for 22 with four home runs and 10 RBIs. And he's he's been spectacular. And the Dodgers are a team that, you know, we all know good things are coming from them. Uh, Betts is proving why it was logical to take him in the first uh, round of playoffs. His teammate, Yoshinobi Yamamoto, had a horrible first effort uh, against the Padres. One inning gave up five runs. It was terrible. Game two against the Cardinals. This is the guy that signed the $325 million contract. This is the guy that people were taking as an SP1, high end SP2. Five shutout innings against the Cardinals, no walks, five strikeouts, gave up two hits. You know, money. And I think that everyone really believes that that second guy is more of who he is than the first guy. Is he going to win the Cy Young Award? All this kind of thing, you know, okay. But Yamamoto reminded people after that horrible start, and I should remind you that one or two starts, okay. Like we talked about earlier, Bailey Ober was terrible first time. If he goes out, looks good next time, who cares? It'll ruin his numbers early in the season, but who cares? No, you know, Yamamoto uh, just rekindled that excitement that there was at draft day with that second effort after that that poor first one. C.J. Abrams is someone that you know there are a lot of people that were in on Abrams in the in this in preseason. You could see his ADP was very high, but a lot of people just weren't you know they weren't in, and it was kind of weird because a lot of people and I've had this discussion with you all many times. A lot of people looked at Abrams and said, "Yeah, right." And not just, yeah, that this hit tool says this guy can hit 280 plus. We saw the running last year, he almost stole 50 bases. He almost went 2050 in his first full season. You know, going 20, almost going 2050 when you're 23 years old, that's pretty good. And though he started out slow ish, he's only two for 10, he's already stolen three bags. And I really do think that, you know, the people that paid up this year, and it was pricey to get Abrams are going to get a good, really good return. The question will be, again, does he hit closer to 245 or 285? And that'll have a big difference with him because he's going to play every day. Uh, he doesn't walk much, so he's going to run up, rack up a lot of plate appearances. I mean, last year he had 614 plate appearances, so that 40-point spread in batting average, if you will, will go a long way to determining his value. But early on, he's running, and he should continue to do that. Uh, let's look at the Padres. I'm Padres, the Pirates. I got the wrong J. 
or the wrong P as I'm pulling up Jerry Jones. And I had a question this morning in Discord, is he for real? Is he legit? Something like that. And I always say to people, what does that mean to you? When you, I understand why you're asking the question, okay? But you got to give me some detail. Like to me, what does legit mean? Oh, I think he's going to make 20 starts and be SP, you know, 59 this year. Is that legit to you? Maybe you say legit and you think he's going to be SP 39 this year. Maybe you're in a deep league and you're not, your expectations are very muted for young pitchers. And you say, well, he'd be legit if he was SP 79. Okay. So the detail always matters. We spent a lot of time, as everyone did, talking about Paul Skeens uh, because of the fact that Paul Skeens is one of the best pitching prospects we've seen in recent years. And he throws 101 miles an hour. Jared Jones is another strong prospect, though. Jared Jones was, I think, 62 at MLB Pipeline. And he had a tremendous spring. And he goes out there on opening day. Well, not opening. His, his first start, excuse me. And he punches out 10 guys in five and two-thirds innings. And it's like, wow. Jared Jones is going to strike out a guy in an inning. It is, I believe that is going to happen. Absolutely. I will point out that he's not always the most efficient pitcher that there are and have been and will continue to be until he proves otherwise. Con command and control issues with him concerns about that and you know the the path to dominance consistently is a difficult one because you got to remember too on the offensive side of things these teams don't haven't seen him they've seen him in camp maybe they watched some video a, a, an advanced scout looked at him throwing two innings in camp and you know they don't they don't know him right once the book gets out on him then the adjustment game happens and that's something to talk about here since we're so early in the season we haven't talked about it this year the adjustment game is what all of this comes down to. Some players are able to make adjustments at bat to at bat or game to game. Some players, it takes more time. Sometimes young guys can make those quick adjustments. Sometimes old guys can't even make those adjustments, right? So there's the, all this back and forth about how the adjustments come. I say it all the time when we talk about this in the, the start of the season every year. Remember, all of these guys, Jared Jones included, all of these guys were the best of the best until they were at least in college, at least in college, right? They were, they were the best. They flew through everything. They might've worked extremely hard. I'm not taking that away from them, but they, how often is Jerry Jones throwing 95 miles an hour in high school, making adjustments? You know, how is Timmy Flanagan, the right fielder, you know, for Podunk high going to hit 95 miles an hour? He's not hitting that. So it doesn't, it just, here's 95, hit it kid. He can't hit it. So it's not until you start to get to the high levels of the, the professional game or into the pros where the adjustments you know, I'm not saying that Jared Jones, as an example, can't make adjustments. He might be great at it, but we just don't have that experience because what Jared Jones is going to do, he's going to go out and attack batters. He's going to go with his stuff because, you know, his changeup is a spotty pitch at this point of his development. His command is spotty. He's coming at you hard. Fastball slider. He's coming at you hard. The book gets out. What does he do in counts? Where does he locate his pitches? Do we see any shift in his release point when he's throwing a slider or a fastball? And those little things get picked up. And then it's like, okay, how does Jones, if he likes to attack high and low, how does he now learn to go left to right? Can he go left to right? Does he leave balls over the middle of the plate? So I'm always, and, I, and again, I'm always reluctant with young players, even when they're really talented because of this. And I, I throw this stupid example out all the time. Mike Trout hit 210 as a rookie. It, go look it up. It happened. Willie Mays struggled so badly, and this is another famous story. He struggled so badly when his first when he was first exposed to the major leagues he cried and was at, he asked his manager to send him back to the minors true story willie mays who my dad and a lot of people from that era say is the greatest player they ever saw play the game this game is hard it's great when you get off to a hot start but it doesn't always tell the full story bottom line with jared jones you know who are you dropping if you had an injury i, I have nick lodolo as an example i knew nick lodolo was going on the injured list right if I was able to put Nick Lodolo on the injured list and, and add Jared Jones over the weekend, fantastic. Fantastic. Did I Do I want to drop Bailey over to do that? Absolutely not. So the move matters. I like the talent. There's opportunity. He's going to get a chance to pitch for the Pirates. Great start and all that. But if I had to do a comp, um, I'd say not last year, but the previous Nick Pavetta, the career-long Nick Pavetta. Strike on any guy with the 1-3 whip. That would kind of be where I would hope things would end up with Jared Jones in his first season. Uh, Brady Singer. Uh, Brady Singer's fascinating. Brady Singer had a tremendous first outing, 10 strikeouts. Brady Singer in the second half of 2022 was fantastic. In 2023, he was horrible, and he had a great start this year. Um, he's a fascinating pitcher because there's there's pieces here. 
Uh, generally speaking, he doesn't walk many guys. He gives you about a strikeout an inning. He keeps the ball on the ground. I mean, 50% ground ball rate. You love to see that. Uh, but last year he was just wonky. His control left him. Um, I think there was some concern about his, his pitch mix too, that, you know, the, the, the fastball slider or, or when he's on or there, but where's that third pitch? And we talk about this all the time. When you don't have a third pitch, it's tough. And I don't mean a third pitch that you can flash six times a game that everyone goes and spits on because I know it's crap. The changeup is huge, huge for Singer. And he's worked on it. There's been all the articles written about it. He's talked about like he understands the need for that third pitch. We'll see how it goes. Singer is put on the watch list. Singer is not a dominator. So don't go run to the waiver wire thinking you're getting all these strikeouts. He's not that guy. But I do have a fondness for Singer. Um, you know, Singer is someone who's had three seasons of what 24 plus starts coming into this year. It's very, it's very possible that at 27 years old, he's made those adjustments that we were talking about. So put him on the watch list. Uh, Paul Blackburn does this every year. Uh, Blackburn is the pay- player that you'll go to the uh, the waiver wire and you'll add him and you'll, and you'll drop him and then someone else add him and someone drop him. And you look at the transition transactions chart over the course of the season, he's been added and dropped like 16 times. Um, there are positives with him, including that first outing, seven shutout innings. But the truth is, he he's he's a guy. He's a streaming guy, Paul Blackburn. So understand that, accept that. There's injuries involved here. There is a lack of run support to be received here with the Athletics. Despite the strikeout an inning last year, I w- I struggle to call him a league average strikeout guy. You know, so he's good start, but. Uh, you know, would I take him or Singer? I'd add Singer if I had that option, just to put some context to it. Uh, Mr. Black Flaherty, excuse me, Mr. Flaherty. Jack Flaherty's starting to get a little interesting. Now, the problem with Flaherty is every time in the last handful of years we've gotten interested with Jack Flaherty, he's gotten hurt. The velocity and stuff was there in spring. He went out in game one through six innings, gave up a run. Uh, no walks, seven strikeouts. That's a banging effort. He was taken in the later rounds of drafts. He may not have been taken. I've gotten a bunch of questions about Flaherty. Flaherty is someone you can dream on. Flaherty is, uh, he's the also Nick Pavetta kind of clone. He's the guy that gives you the strikeout in inning, but you just don't know where the ratios are going to be. And you look at, you know, Flaherty's numbers the last two years. I mean, his whip is one six the last two years. The last time he threw 145 innings in the big leagues was 2019. He's had issues where he's um, struggled with coaching. Um, he's been kind of stubborn, I think, is a fair way to put it. So, I think I think you got to if you're him and you're 28 years old and you thought you're going to get this contract this offseason, you got one year from the Tigers. We got to go. It's go time, as they say. Right. So is that Mandelbaum from Seinfeld. It's go, it's go time. Mandelbaum. Man, yeah. Maybe you don't know what that is, but look it up. It's a good show. Uh, <laughs> I am. Did I just date myself on my birthday? Maybe. Flaherty is, is again, he's intriguing. Everything we've seen to this point in time has been a positive with Flaherty velocity, the production, the results, all been a positive. Can he carry this forward? I think that is the zillion dollar question. Uh, Like what we've seen to date, but there are the legitimate concerns. If you have questions about specific guys, again, you can throw a couple here in in chat and I'll answer a few at the end of the show. But also remember, you can hit us up at Discord over at fantasyguru.com. That's part of your full season package. It's part of any of the packages you get, whether you get the seasonal or the DFS or the wagering, you get access to the Discord room for that package. Uh, FSD 20 is the promo code there. Finally, let's go to some cold. Now this one I struggled with because, you know, everyone has said it, everyone has seen it. I'm not trying to bag on a guy. Okay. But I saw this explained terrifically. I forget who the tweet was right after this happened. Royce Lewis comes up, hits a home run. Royce Lewis gets on base a second time. Royce Lewis gets hurt running around second base and has to be removed from the game. And it was termed the Royce Lewis experience. I mean, Aaron Judge is going to get hurt. Giancarlo Stanton's going to get hurt. Byron Buxton's going to get hurt. Mike Trout's going to get hurt. Royce Lewis is going to get hurt. It's just going to happen. And the Royce Lewis scenario, I mean, we're here in weeks. It could be up to two months before he's back out there on the field. Um, if you watch... And this is the thing, I, I, I didn't see it happen live, but I caught it like five minutes after it happened, right? And I'm looking at the video and everything. Royce Lewis hurt his quad so badly that he's going to be shut down for a month. 
and then he's going to have to build back up. He's going to miss two months of action because he was rounding second base. Did you all watch? Like, he was rounding second base. I've hurt myself. You've probably hurt yourself playing sports. Have you ever injured your quad, your thigh, rounding a bag? You can injure your ankle rounding a bag. You roll your ankle. That happens, sure. How do you injure your quad to the point where you're out for a month rounding second base? I... I love the kid. Kyle Frank and I interviewed him years ago for the prospect special we used to do at Sirius XM. He was a nice guy, um, talked to us, was open about things. Everyone that interviewed Lewis before the draft said this is a great kid. I think everyone that's been around him since says this is a great kid. Infectious energy, positive outlook. Even after he was hurt, he was joking with the media, talking about how he's too good for his body or, or some joke like that. Like He seems like a great kid, and we know he's extremely talented, but he can't stay on the field. So what do you do with Royce Lewis? I mean, you dream. And I, I hope that if you drafted Royce Lewis, you took another corner infielder, you took another third baseman, you're able to grab someone off the waiver arcs. Again, it's going to be an extended period of time that he's out of the lineup. But this is perfectly encapsulated, and this is the Royce Lewis experience. And it sucks because he's a tremendous guy. He's a 30-20 guy waiting to happen. He's a superstar waiting to happen. And he just cannot stay on the field. Uh, Sean Murphy has an oblique issue. This one sucks. Personally, this one sucks because I, I got down to the last pick in my draft at the on the offensive side of things. I think it was the FSGA league. I they all ran together. I forget which league it was, but I was down to my last pick, and it was either Gary Sanchez or Travis Darno. And I'm like, I need some pop. I'll go with Gary Sanchez. Well, Travis Darno now in a 15 team mixed league is very valuable because he's going to get some run here as the starting catcher for the Braves. It sounds like it's a great grade one strain for Sean Murphy, so it's not significant, but that could be two to four weeks. Again, he's a catcher too. You can't hide a guy that's got an oblique issue at catcher. Like that's not like you can put him in right field and don't throw very hard. Like you're catching, so that you got to be back at 100 to do that. It's a tough break for Murphy. Uh, he's still he's still a guy that should be really good when he plays, but now we have to lop off a couple of weeks. In a best case scenario, it might be a little longer than that, as I just noted. Travis Darno is somewhat of interest now uh, because he is an effective offensive player. And, you know, he is, when you're looking at a guy and you're thinking in spring, he's going to get 238 plate appearances this year. Maybe that number is now 338 because he's going to get a lot of run here in the short term. Even if, and maybe you and your league didn't invest in Will Smith or JT Romuto, a catcher. Maybe you, you want to ride the Braves offense train and you want to add Travis Darno for the next three weeks and see what the hell happens because Camposano's on the waiver wire in your league. Mitch Garver's on the waiver wire in your league because you have a one catcher league. I can understand going with Darno. Just make sure you're not making a signal. Don't, don't do something like I'm dropping my top five catcher. I'm dropping Francisco Alvarez to add. Tra don't do that. But that's a rough situation uh, if you have. Uh, Mr. Murphy on your team. I mentioned this earlier, Canley Jansen, just as a follow-up. Canley Jansen's got the back issue that he dealt with at the end of camp. It's still bothering him a little bit. It seems like the Red Sox keep feeling like he's going to be able to pitch through this, and maybe he can pitch through this, but it is, it's lingering, and it's causing him to not be available on certain days. So that's something to watch closely. Chris Martin would be the guy that I would anticipate would get the majority of, of work in the ninth inning if Jansen were to go down. So if you're playing the speculation game, add Chris Martin right now understand as we are seeing that a lot of times even when there is an injury or an opportunity we don't know how a manager is going to play it we don't know how these managers we don't know if these managers are going to go with one guy two guys is it lefty righty is it you know stuff this guy's elevated fastball this guy's sinker like so understand that it, we're in the world of nebulousness i just made up a word because i don't know if that's a word uh, we're in the world of we should all be playing in souls leagues but that's just not the situation we have there's a bunch of players that I listed here. Like Jordan Alvarez is off to a slow start. Who cares, right? All right, we don't really need to talk about Jordan Alvarez. Vinny Pascatino, I, again, remember we're talking about such a small sample size here. We're talking about five games that none of this is fair. Vinny Pascatino, you shouldn't change your outlook at all on Vinny P. Uh, he has started off slowly. He's one for 11, whatever. Who cares? Um, his exit velocity, this is funny. His exit velocity on his eight batted balls is 82 miles an hour. You know, that number is going to go up nine miles an hour over the course of the year. So don't, don't worry. Have patience here. I think there's a few names here though, that I just wanted to hit on. Anthony Rendon is batting lead off for the, like I, someone, multiple people have asked me about Luis Rangifo. Rangifo had a leg issue that happened multiple times with his hamstring. He wasn't in the lineup actively at the start of the season because they were making sure he was healthy. I still think Rangifo has got a shot to take over the, the lead off job with the angels. Certainly not going to be Anthony Rendon long-term. 
but yeah, Rangifo is, and a lot of people, I bet some of you even listening, you dropped Rangifo, right? Because he wasn't doing anything early. You were concerned about playing time. You're concerned he wasn't. Do, he qualifies at four positions. And I, I mean, I've said this. I wrote a player profile about him, and I said, look, you know, 18 home runs and eight steals and 65 RBIs and 78 runs scored. I don't know. I'm making these numbers up. Like these can happen, and he qualifies at four positions. He, for those of you that are in the the head to head leagues and you love having your entire bench be pitchers, Luis Rangifo is the perfect guy to have because he can go in four spots. I've only got two hitters on my bench right. Have one of them be Luis Rangifo because you can play him everywhere whenever there's someone that has an injury or a day off. Uh, I'm still bullish on him despite a slow start. Uh, and Anthony Rendon, yeah, we've talked about him. Brandon Nimmo's had a slow start. Who cares? Brandon Nimmo, all that matters to Brandon Nimmo is health. If he stays healthy, he's at the top of the, the Mets order, he's going to score 90-plus runs. It's just going to happen. And remember, too, the Mets right now, they've got Jeff McNeil hitting cleanup because they don't have J.D. Martinez. J.D. Martinez will be back here soon. Um, you know, is he ramping up, getting back in, in game shape after the late signing? And then that becomes a banging group at the top. You know, Nemo, Lindor, who struggled to start, Alonzo, J.D. Martinez, Starling Marte, who I was watching the game the other day when he hit that home run, destroyed that ball. And they were really effusive of praise with Marte on the broadcast about the fact that he's healthy this spring. His lower body looks better. He's able to engage his lower body in a swing more. Now, of course, he's going to get hurt at some point. But, uh, you know, he's looked sharp. So the, the top five, at least for the Mets order, you know, there's really something to be said for that. And because of the, the strength there at the top of the order, Brendan Nimmo obviously is someone that we need to not be nervous about, at least at this point in time. Nolan Arenado. Slow finish last year, didn't do great things in camp, and had a slow start to the year. Is the back really a long-term issue? As a back struggler myself, maybe. We'll, we'll have to see. But Arenado is someone that, you know, we've talked about a lot. Nolan Arenado is legitimately on a Hall of Fame path. He is arguably still the top overall third baseman. He's close. I'm not saying fantasy third baseman. I'm saying top overall third baseman. Is he the player he was three years ago? I think it's fair to say no, but he's still a great player. And there's still a very reasonable expectation that he'll be very effective this year without being dominant. So show some patience. If things change, we'll make adjustments, but that's where we need to be with him. Now, a couple of these names here. Jose Abreu. Jose Abreu is... He's an interesting guy. Uh, I don't think he got enough credit at times. He got too much credit when his career began because he had that massive rookie season and everyone thought he was going to hit 317 with 36 home runs every year. And he never did that again. Uh, but he's had a really good career, right? Uh, he did a 317 one year with 33 home runs. He almost got there a couple years later. But, you know, he slowed down in the power department substantially the last couple of years. He is not a great athlete, so he looks like a DH, right? And last year, the bottom kind of fell out. He did end up producing 90 RBIs because the strength of the uh, order with the Astros and the fact that he played a lot, but he really didn't do much. And in the early going this year, he's done nothing. Now he's hit fifth, fifth, and sixth in his three starts. If they continue to utilize him in the middle of the order there, because remember they moved Kyle Tucker up this year smartly, did the Astros, Abreu can still drive and runs, but... With each passing month, I'm going to say, which again is not fair, but with each passing month, the concern level grows with Abreu because he's 37 years old. And when you're a non-athletic 37-year-old player, and you know there's been a lot of discussion about his um, his batted ball profile. He used to pull the ball about 40% of the time. Then the number dropped to 38% a couple of years ago. Then the number dropped to 34% last year. And you normally say, well, that's good. He's using the field better. Yeah. He's losing bat speed. He's starting to guess a little bit more. Okay. And, and you know, this happens. I mean, this is this is what happened. He's 37 years old. His exit velocity was over 92 miles an hour for four straight seasons heading into last year. And last year was 89 miles an hour. He's simply, he's losing it because of his age. And again, this happens to all of us. It's my birthday today. I'm losing it because of my age. So bottom line with Abreu is if you drafted him to be a corner full guy, you can't panic off four games. I hope your expectations were you know, replication of last year. Like you weren't expecting 30 home runs or expecting him to 270. Like he's just not that guy anymore. Let's give him a little bit of time. Joey Gallo is, I mean, I've got injuries in these 15 team mixes. I got a, my dynasty. I already have six guys on the injured list. So I'm looking at 
trying to, can I add these, you know, Joey Gallo type of player? And it's like, okay, maybe he's going to play in the start of the season because they're going to give him some run before they turn to Cruz and Woods and make these changes to the Nationals. He's got six strikeouts and 12 at-bats. It's like, right? So you know who Joey Gallo is. If you want to make the move to Joey Gallo, make the move to Joey Gallo. Um, hope he hits 210 for you with 18 home runs before he loses his job or gets traded. But the early returns with him, I couldn't even grab him in that 15-team league where I had a need. Uh, another guy that's you know, similar-ish in terms of the approach. He walks a lot, strikes out too much. Is Jack Sawinski of the Pirates. Sawinski, you know, sneakily, if that's the right way to say it, he went 25-10 last year. You know, he stole 13 bases. He also hit 224, and he is clearly a platoon guy. Though he has struggled here in the very early going, he is not he's not doing a gallo. His strikeout rate is 27%. So Winsky is the type of player, as is Gallo, um, that you just have to ride it out. If you're going to have these guys on your roster, you have to understand that there's going to be a week where they hit 350. And there's going to be a week where they hit 110. That's just how it's going to go. There are going to be weeks where they play six games. There's going to be weeks where they play four games because they're facing lefties and righties in different varying amounts, too. So just keep all of that in mind. Uh, nothing to panic about with Sawinski. He's just off to a slow start, and I just wanted to highlight him a little bit um, as we're having this discussion here. Okay, let's talk a little bit about some of your questions. And again, you can send all your questions over to the Discord at fantasyguru.com. We'll be in there all day. Uh, just a note before we get to those questions, the DFS space. We're covering the DFS game for Major League Baseball, obviously, at fantasyguru.com. Go to the Join Now tab in the top right. Sign up for the package there. Uh, I will be writing the cash game breakdown Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. On Wednesdays, it'll be Ted Schuster. Now, we'll have GPP articles on all those days, too. But in terms of the cash game breakdown, I'm doing Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Ted Schuster is doing Wednesday. Why is that? On Wednesdays, I'm on the Jeff Mann's Elite Sports Show on Sirius XM for three hours. And I just, I don't have time on the calendar to get the article done because I'll be on that show for three hours from three to six Eastern. Uh, the cash game breakdown will not be written on days where there are five, fewer than five games played. This Thursday, there's only four games on the slate. There'll be no cash game breakdown on Thursday or yeah, on Thursday as a result. So cash game breakdown has to be five games because if, if it gets too small, we're just going to do the GPP thing, right? We can't build a cash game lineup when, when the lineup, when the, 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 the slate is that small. So any slate under five games, no cash game breakdown. Again, I'm on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Ted Schuster on Wednesdays, and then the crew taking care of things over on the weekend. Okay. Let's look at the, the uh, chat room here. Tim Bressler. Here we go, Tim. Ray, we have wiki pitcher rankings in your articles on Guru Elite last year, like you did this year, like you did last year. Well, it's not Guru Elite anymore. I still have a Guru Elite hat. It's fantasyguru.com now. We're the Elite Mafia. We kept that moniker, but it's fantasyguru.com. Uh, just to address it directly, the <laughs> I'm going to be completely honest with everyone. Um, I've had like two days off in six months, and I haven't had a vacation in four years. Uh, I can't Simply, I simply put, can't work 12 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Can't do it. And I do my best to be available and to get everything done. And I'm doing shows and I'm doing DFS and I'm doing seasonal. And I'm answering questions and I'm doing football behind the scenes. I, so I can't, I just can't, I don't have the time. Okay. 75 hour work weeks is enough for me. So what we, we had to make a change because Rob Povia, who was writing the weekly planner piece in the past, um, Situation changed for him, so he wasn't able to do his great article he's done the last few years. We weren't going to have anything for the weekly planner um, because, again, I, you know, it's it's I'm working on Easter the day before my birthday to get the weekly planner up that we got up yesterday. So that's what we're going to have. So to answer the question directly, Tim, we will not have an article that is as in depth or as good as the one we had last year um, because Rob's not doing it anymore. I don't have the time to do it. It just doesn't fit the calendar or the schedule. So I will do my best to answer questions for everybody. Again, the article I posted Sunday, uh, the weekly planner piece, should be available. It lists lefty-righty matchup. It lists probable pitchers. It's got the, the um, park factors there. It's got offenses home and away, how they performed. Uh, what you saw yesterday is what we're going to see moving forward in terms of the weekly planner piece. Uh, Tim's got another question. Long story short on the pitching staff, but trying to decide between to pitch Luis Heel with his two starts versus Arizona and Toronto, or uh, Ronel Blanco at home versus Houston and Texas. Um, well, Blanco is on Texas. I'm, I'm on Houston, right? 
Uh, I'm not pitching anyone against the Texans right now. Um, I would rather have heel um, than Blanco. Blanco's got an intriguing arm, but he's very likely to lose his spot in the rotation when they get healthy. You know, Tweedy and Verlander and McCullers and all these guys, they got injured out. Um, I'm not looking directly at the matchup because I don't have the article up here, but I'm going to go with uh, heel uh, of the Yankees here. And again, he's someone that was flying up draft boards, uh, but because of the arm strength, um, he does face Arizona on the road and I guess Toronto at home. Those are not great matchups. And with a guy that has a great arm, but has had control issues, despite looking good in spring, I, I don't love those matchups. So he would not be someone I'd be stuffing in my lineup if I had, you know, unless I had to, I would like to go in a different direction there. Um, Alexander Bush said, Puck was dropped in my league. Is he worth the pickup or are you concerned with the first start? Of course I'm concerned with the first start. It's also for first start. Who cares? Uh, and I, I've talked a lot about Puck. It's interesting. No one cared about Puck a month ago. Everyone cared about Puck three weeks ago. Now people want to be out on Puck after one start. It's just, dude, I, I'm very confused by the roller coaster nature. As I have said previously, Puck has no innings built up. No idea how long he's, he's, he can go. If they want him to make 25 starts, no idea if he can because A, he doesn't have innings built up, and B, any time in the past where he's tried to do that, he's gotten hurt. He's really found his home in the bullpen. They decided to change that because they had no choice. They have three starting pitchers that are out. If Puck has a couple of rough starts here, when Cabrera comes back, when Yuri Perez comes back, when Braxton Garrett comes back, do they shift Puck to the bullpen? They very well could. What if Max Meyer pitches very well? Well, there's another guy that could force Puck out of the rotation. So Puck is someone who you can dream on. He's got a big arm. He had a strong spring. He added pitches to his pitch mix because he realized he was trying to start again. But this is something that, you know, there's workload concerns, there's health concerns, and there's role concerns. It's all three. So, you know, I've always said this, and I'll maintain this. If you rostered Puck as you did, and you were only going to give him one start, you should have never drafted him. If you're going to give a guy one start and you're going to drop him, you should never draft him. This is just the wrong guy for you. So that's the, the Puck situation. Puck could make 25 starts and be really good. But there are legitimate concerns to what his role, his health, uh, and his extendedness, if that's a word, uh, can be. So it's the AJ Puck experience. If you're in on Puck, you got to be in on Puck. Just like I was saying, if you drafted him, you just got to be in on the talent. You got to be in on the strong spring. You got to be in on all the positivity um, that was around him because everyone was really excited. It's just one start. Disappointing one, but it was just one start. Um, let's see here. Uh, Anthony Donald drafted Rangifa waiver on as, uh, as Drupal Cabrera. Agree or disagree? I disagree. Totally disagree. Uh, like I said, um, go look at the rankings of fantasyguru.com. It's been less than a week. I'm not changing my outlook for a guy for six months off less than a week. Cabrera could be added. I added him in Tout Wars because I had injuries. I spent 38 of a thousand fab dollars on him. I think there was one other bid for Cabrera. Like no one even, I was the only one that even bid on him. Um, Cabrera's fine to add, but when the team gets healthy, he's not in the lineup daily. I don't think, uh, his offense is, you know, he's had a good start here. Sure. And like I said, I took a chance. I spent $4, 4% of my budget on him, less than 4% of my budget. I'll take a shot. I have injuries. I am I planning on him being a superstar for me this year? No. Uh, I have Luis Rangifo on that team. Didn't drop Luis Rangifo to Adam. I would not. I'd go back and add or erase the waiver wire. I'd keep Rangifo. That, that'd be my call. Um, you know, it says here that you're fifth on the waiver wire. I I wouldn't even, I'd keep my waiver priority, but that's me. Sal says, happy birthday, Ray. Thank you. appreciate that. Sal, yes, it is indeed my birthday. So there we go, folks. Um, thank you for that. Uh, don't, again, forget to visit. I'm sure you won't. Fantasyguru.com. We still have the, the seasonal product up right now. You can get it now. We'll help you through the entirety of the season. We'll answer your questions in Discord. There'll be the articles at the website. There'll be the updated rankings that start on May 1st, the first of every month. I update the entire ranking, 600 plus guys. So you always know where your guys stand, where the guys you're looking to make a trade for, where they're at. That's part of the package over at fantasyguru.com. So that piece is there. The DFS piece is available now, obviously. I mentioned the scheduling a few minutes ago. We're rocking and rolling on a daily basis there. We've got the wagering. Um, you know, I guess it was beginner's luck. Last week, I, I threw a couple of bets out. They both hit. Uh, we'll hope to continue that along. Uh, the Elite uh, Elite Sports Game Time Show is Monday through Thursday from 8 to 10 Eastern. On that show, we'll talk about whatever bets um, the day brings. And I'll say this too on that angle. I am not... 
I'm not going to put out 18 bets a day. There will be days that there will be no bets. If I don't feel it, not pushing it. It's very likely that there'll be at least one, if not two bets, Monday through Thursday, because we have that show on SiriusXM. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it'll all depend on what I see, okay? Um, I am not, to be perfectly straight with everyone, I'm not a gambler. I've never gambled. Uh, you can't wager in California. It's not legal. Uh, my grandfather had a gambling problem, so I've just never, I've just stayed away from that whole thing. Um, but uh, I'll do my best to identify matchups that I think are advantageous. Uh, we hit a, a prop for total bases for Ezekiel Duran, and we hit one for Ketel Marte um, there as well. So we'll, we'll we'll try to have a strong winning record without volume, if that makes sense. And uh, excuse me, I think the first two bets were like minus one forty five and minus one sixty five too. I'm I, and we talked about this on the show. I'm trying to help you win. Okay, I'm not trying to help you hit something that's crazy seven leg parlay for a plus two thousand. I'm talking about we're going to turn your cash now into a bigger amount of cash, <laughs> okay? Even if it's not a huge, we're going to win. So that's my goal with that. Again, Monday through Thursday, there'll be at least one, uh, if not a couple of bets. Uh, and then the rest of the time, we'll have to see. But the wagering package is available. The DFS package is available. The seasonal package is available. Go to the top right of the, the website. Click on the Join Now tab. Uh, toss in that promo code FSD20. See if it works. Uh, we've also got the NFL package. Right now, the we've been talking to the guys, and we'll talk to Tyler Beaker on Wednesday this week. No, wait. Is it Thursday this week? Let me look real quickly before I throw that out there. Luckily, I have my handy-dandy schedule right here, and Tyler is coming on Thursday. Tyler will be on Thursday at the middle of the show. The days all run together when you're old like me. Uh, Tyler will be on Thursday to talk football. Uh, we've got the football package. You can see it on the screen there, 1999. Uh, it's the off-season package, the fantasy mode. We'd get you all the – off-season coverage of all the player movement, all the free agency, all of that. Obviously, into the draft, we're having all the draft profiles up. We talked to Russell Clay last week about all these first-round talents. Uh, that's available right now. We've got the all-in NBA pack, all-in package, uh, if you will. That includes everything you see on the screen there, and it's for thirty-nine dollars. And you get it through the postseason, so you get NBA, NHL, PGA, MMA, soccer, racing, all DFS all wagering for all of those sports. And when you get that all-in package, you also get access to the Game Time Discord room, which we follow along live while we're doing the show on SiriusXM. That's a nice little added bonus there. So all the sports, ways for you to get involved. I hope you take advantage of something here. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, you got it, Tim. You bet. Um, I want to thank everyone for the time today. Hopefully you'll be back with us tomorrow, again, at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. We'll continue to rock and roll here and talk in baseball, having some fun. Uh, with fantasyguru.com. Tell a friend about the show at least. Help us get some more eyeballs on this for the advertising and all of that. Uh, and if you would, uh, we're happy to help you if you want to sign up for some or all. Get the MVP all-in package. You get everything at fantasyguru.com. Uh, however you want to play it, we're here to help you have success in 2024. I'm Ray Flowers. This has been Fantasy Sports Daily, powered by fantasyguru.com. <laughs>